Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Fred. Um, a couple things. First of all, to all my Arts 101 students in the house today, uh, Anna is not here, so rather than take attendance, I'm going to ask you to take a picture of this or a selfie or something that shows you in this room and email it to me. Second of all, today we're going to be talking about trauma in art, which means we're going to be talking about a lot of potentially and looking at and hearing a lot of potentially uncomfortable things. Things like nudity, uh, swear words, racial epithets, um, representations of kind of horrific things. So just warning you, if any of those put you in a particularly rough place, I won't be offended if anyone has to step out, and I'll do my best to try and say what's coming as much as possible. So is art separate from life? This is often a, a question I make my Arts 101 students try and answer. Do we use art to escape ourselves or to affirm ourselves? Do we use art to avoid politics or do we use art to engage in politics? Uh, there are obviously examples of art that are each of these things. But the question about the appropriate role for art, as well as what art can do, is possible, has the possibility of doing, is one that we have at the legislative popular and pedagogical level? Does art's status give it any political power, or is art too intense a sphere to deal with political issues? Well, one person who attempted to answer this question was a writer named Jean-Paul Sartre. Sartre was an existentialist, which means that he thought humans could find true meaning in the world only by addressing their messy lives within it, not trying to remove themselves and think about it coldly. Sartre thought that the political question was central to the question of doing art at all, and he wrote an essay about it called Why Write? Why do it? Why write something or paint something or write music instead of watching television or drinking or becoming a police officer or just having a family and not worrying about it your whole life? And this is his answer. If I am given this world with its injustices, it is not so that I might contemplate them coldly, but that I might animate them with my indignation, that I might disclose them and create them with their nature as injustices, that is, as abuses to be suppressed. So he's talking about platforming here in a kind of way. I'm going to use my art to give a platform to issues that I think need that platform. For Sartre, the world glows with injustice, but also he wrote plays and literature in order to light up the parts of the world he thought were too dark, or perhaps to light up ones that were already lit, but in a different way. A contemporary of Sartre was the writer Theodore Adorno. Now, Adorno was one of my favorite writers. All um, jazz and pop music are simply garbage, you know what they're to, which I obviously don't agree with, but I do think he had an uncanny ability for analyzing social situations. He was also very pessimistic about our potential on the, on the planet, as this meme uh, illustrates. That's old Adorno on the bottom. Um, on the top is Michel Foucault, another person who is famous for uh, interpreting the different ways that people have power over us, maybe without us knowing about it. He's been in my I got from Foucault, that buildings are designed to move us in particular ways, even when we don't know it. Of course, he thought maybe we could get out from under that. Adorno, not so much. Anyway, Adorno responded directly to Sartre's, Sartre's statement about why, why he writes. Adorno was German living in the time of World War II. He fled Hitler's Germany, ended up in Beverly Hills, like a lot of German modernists. Beverly Hills in 1945 was kind of the height of European modernism. Um, and he wrote a lot about how artists use art to deal with the Holocaust. William Schoenberg had written a piece that uses texts from people who were in concentration camps and, and uh, tries to recreate their voices. And Adorno was very skeptical about this. He said that art that represents the horror that happened by turning suffering into images, harsh and uncompromising though they are, it wounds the shame we feel in the presence of victims. For these victims are used to create something, works of art that are thrown to the consumption of the world which destroyed them. You might recognize that from the title of the talk. That the art, you can be the best intentioned artist in the world. You can be wanting to help people. You can be wanting to do justice to their suffering. But he said it's impossible to do that without at some level taking their suffering and making it into from the consumption of the world which destroyed them. Not just for people to consume, but for the people who did nothing, maybe. For the people who 
The so-called artistic representation of the sheer physical pain of people beaten to the ground by rifle butts contains, however remotely, the power to elicit enjoyment out of it. Now these are issues that I have a hard time arguing with. We don't always enjoy art that represents suffering. But enjoy might be the wrong word. Fulfill might be another word. Feel like a catharsis for. Some of my favorite movies I never want to see again because they were so intense. But I did feel good after having seen them. And for Adorno, even that is too far. You should not feel good after having dealt with these issues because then you're already not doing the justice. So I have three basic questions when I look at art and ask, how is it handling the trauma that it represents? One, what is at stake for the artist? Who is telling the story? Why are they telling the story? How much of themselves are they putting into the story, and is that appropriate? How is the audience being treated? We'll get to that, what that means more specifically later. Who is included or excluded from that audience? And what is being done for victims? How are the victims? that the art is attempting to represent And what work is art actually doing in the world? A lot of people will say, well, art should address political issues because it needs to be relevant, because it needs to make, bring awareness to those issues. My response to that is that journalism brings awareness to these issues. Why, what does art do that is different? That's what we're here for today. Dr. Guy started by saying, art has to play differently than something like journalism or history lecture. And I agree, but I'm kind of going in the other direction. So what is it doing to those images that we're using? What is it doing to this representation that we couldn't just read in a history book? And is that a good thing? Um, on the subject of the Holocaust, there was a documentary made in the 80s called Shoah, uh, directed by this man, Frenchman. Uh, Shoah is the Hebrew word for the Holocaust. Um, whether a documentary is art is something I'll leave for another time. But Shoah is notable because unlike other documentaries, interviews with survivors and a couple surviving guards. No Ken Burns-style images, no historical, you know, timelines, no, no setting up to show you the history of what happened, nothing. Just interviews with people who survived. And it's nine hours long, which is another thing about it. Um, while the shocking images of the suffering, and they are shocking if you've ever watched any other documentary about the Holocaust, are removed, what remains is no less powerful or controversial. Here's the director interviewing a prisoner who worked as a barber in a concentration camp and now runs a barber shop in New York City. Me, isn't that what you're doing here? What's going to help me, us? What could you tell them? What could you tell? A friend of he worked as a barber. He was also a good barber in my hometown. When his wife and his sister to the gas chamber. I think the director is right. We need these stories on film. But the question here is, uh, what responsibility does the director have to not make this man fit? How is it worth it, basically, to repeat the trauma, basically, in his mind? There is an ancient Greek philosopher named Aristotle, who gave us this word, catharsis, for what he thought art was. For Aristotle, His two big emotions that he thought were not good for society were pity. You shouldn't have pity on someone that you're supposed to be punishing. You should be rational. And fear. 
fear. You shouldn't fear things that you need to overcome. And what he liked about the theater was you could go into the theater, watch a play, pity someone on the stage, fear something that's happening, and just basically get it over with, get it out of you. That's what catharsis is, kind of like a purge. You're going through something so that you don't have to deal with it anymore. Bertolt Brecht, a socialist playwright, thought that in order to put a political message into your play, it had to be more indirect. He pioneered what he called the strangeness effect, which takes normal situations, so each step is something slightly off about. Of so that you as an audience member are constantly thinking, what, what is going on here? What am I missing? Please don't work with something not right. His hope was that then you would leave the theater and look around at society and think, what, what else am I missing? Some examples he gives of when you're estranged from something is like the first time you see your mother kiss your father. And suddenly, your whole orientation about what this being is in relationship to you has changed, and now she's acting in a weird way towards another person, and she's the same person, but somehow different. Another more simple example is when you say a word too many times, and suddenly it doesn't sound like a word, you don't know what that would be, like, oh my God, what is my word? You know, everything like that. You're estranged from it, right? You're alienated from your experience. Stanley Cavill was an art and theater theorist um, in the 60s. And he thought that theater was inherently frustrating because we can't intervene. You see someone sneaking up on someone else, and you can't run up there and stop it. And so you're inherently sort of oppressed. You feel frustrated by that experience. And he thought that that was good because your frustration in the theater will build up so much that when you go out into the world and you see something that you maybe can do something to stop, you'll be compelled to act because that frustration Uh, the playwright uh, Rick Burkhart likely had all of these in mind when making the play Conversation Storm, which takes place entirely in a diner as three friends are with well, whether it's actually to work with someone to take life away from Here in the scene I'm about to show you, they argue about what could be done if a terrorist had planted a bomb in New York City that was going to go off in 30 minutes and you had an end of the And so they use their role play. The guy who is anti-torture is pretending to be the interrogator. The guy who is pro-torture is pretending to be the terrorist. He's trying to show the other one what someone would logically do in this situation and why that makes it wrong. Do you talk? So this guy is role-playing as the interrogator. This guy is role-playing within the play about friends at a diner. You don't know. Not good enough. Scene 32, Agent Godfrey suggests crushing one of your testicles. You know? Godfrey, you imbecile, we can't do that, he might black. So there's some, sorry, just depictions of bodily uh, torture in this. Look out, we need him conscious. Scene 33, we grab a steak knife from the kitchen and pry it off a fingernail. Stop it. According to Jay Bybee, it's okay. I said stop it. I'll stop it when we get the nuclear bomb. It's in Columbus Circle. Because it's in Columbus Circle. No, say that with more dripping bitterness. You've Shut just... up! Perfect. A pair of choppers to Columbus Circle. Scene 34, were you telling us the truth? Of course not. Of course not, that's what we think too. We have no choice but to bring in your son. What? Your son. What? So, uh, it gets more gruesome from there in the depiction of what could be done to extract information. Um, now, as an anti-torture person myself, this play excited me because I saw basically mapped out for me the argument that I can make when I am confronted with someone who disagrees with me. They really just, he, he makes a really good argument in this play about why torture is never okay. Um, in a sense, it combines all three forms of theatrical activism mentioned above. A negative, it again reproduces images of, these, of this torture. It takes the idea that a terrorist acts a certain way, or is a certain kind of person, and takes it on the world. It creates the idea that this is something that humans could do, which might create the idea that it's something they should do. It reproduces images wounding and pain, leading directly to results. And is putting more of these images in the world worth teaching me how to outsmart my Uncle Steve at Thanksgiving or something like that, you know? Sorry, I'm just not really. Um, now, sometimes trauma in art is not a representation. 
consider this performance piece, Art Must Be Beautiful, Artist Must Be Beautiful, by the performance artist Marina Abramovich. This contains some uh, brief nudity, I think. In the piece, Abramovich brushes her hair very hard over the course of a long time with a metal brush. Uh, repeating the phrase, art must be beautiful, which is at the least a commentary on the impossible standards that women artists and women artists are held to. to see in this representation, but towards the end of the video, her scalp starts to bleed and blood starts to drip down the sides of her uh, head as she keeps going with it. There are a couple of ways to look at her stake here. Remember, that was the first thing I think about. What is the artist's stake and what's going on? An obvious uh, answer is that her stake is very high. She is actually putting her own body on the line. She is inflicting trauma upon herself. She doesn't get more at stake than that. On the other hand, by doing so in an artistic situation, she is kind of taking a rather privileged position and choosing to inflict trauma on herself. That ability to make the choice to inflict trauma on yourself might in itself kind of be a slight against people who do not get to make that choice. This is the constant dance. Bringing awareness. Are you bringing awareness in such a way that will actually create positive change? Or are you making more images of the kind of thing you're trying to get rid of? It is a tenet of fine art discourse that art should speak for itself, universally, no matter who the artist is in The reality is that culture and war seems to be to all but eliminate the possibility of this being true. The diversity of human experience on this planet is revealed to be so extreme that there's no way we can discount personal experience in interpreting art as friendly. In the age of identity politics, where we are acting as a parody of the latest gender and sexuality of life, and other constructs constantly, and when I to all possible who the artist is becomes quite important. Because there is an increased stake in making sure that the stories are being told by people who have the right to tell those stories. However, we determine what the right is. Ironically, since I don't think Adorno would have liked identity politics very much, I think this approach actually does take a story about whether victims are being paraded in our work quite seriously. The instances of artists telling their own stories are so common as to me, hardly need elaborate uh, sorry, reading and trying to be closer at the same time. The instances of artists telling their own stories are so common that I hardly need to elaborate on them. But I will, uh, obviously. Consider this Kendrick Lamar song, uh, Black with a Berry. And it's a Kendrick Lamar song, so it's going to have a lot of um, offensive, quote unquote, language in it. We're just going to listen to the last verse of it here.
In addition to touching on some elements of black power in the song, Lamar also couches some criticism he has about the discourse of black power. And he performs this in a kind of anxious way, like he's trying to make a decision, like all these forces are pushing against him at the same time. It really matters that he is the one delivering these lyrics. It matters that he is an African-American man from Compton, someone giving this message to you. If I released a song with these exact same lyrics and these exact same rhythms, it would mean something different. And I don't think there's anything you can argue about that. But that's what I want to say. Uh, let's talk about another artist who represents their own trauma in art. Where am I at here? Frida Kahlo in this painting, Henry Ford Hospital. Peter Callow painted this after going through a miscarriage in Detroit, which is an unfamiliar city for her. She uh, went through the procedure at Henry Ford Hospital, which was sort of in the middle of one of the industrial areas of Detroit. Now, she was a symbolist painter, which means that you're going to see a lot of things that are kind of surreal, these images that are sort of just plot there for you to deal with, and they're supposed to sort of correlate directly to a representation of some emotion or theme. So just a quick Reader's Digest interpretation of, of what we have here. Um, we have her lying nude on a bed. Did Henry Ford Hospital actually make his patients lay nude on the bed? Probably not. What we have here is probably a representation of some kind of vulnerability, a lack of cover. Um, she ties herself to all these different symbols. One is a snail, a symbol of a slow speed, how we representative of how long these things continue to take. When you're going through a health event, especially no. Things that people talk about as though they happen quickly do not happen quickly. They take a long, long time and it affects not only the life of the patient but the life of everyone around them. Um, I think we had these sort of a, a couple of things that I think emphasize what she found to be the sterile nature of the hospital. So we had this metal machine. I don't even know what it does, but it does look like a machine that would be in a room that you don't know what it does and other people know what it does and they say you should trust them when they're using it on your body, but you don't know if you should trust them to use it on your body. We have here an anatomy dummy, the kind of thing you might have and learn about in med school. Might represent the way she feels to some of these doctors that she doesn't know very well, that she is just an example to them, not someone who is going through this in a particular way. You can see the sort of uh, cityscape of industrialized Detroit in the background. Um, no walls, again, the Henry Ford Hospital actually houses patients in a field on a bed, probably not. But in some senses, this sense of isolation, the sense that you're just in the middle of nowhere with no one and nothing around you, to be directly tied to some of these experiences. Now, if we're talking about who has the right to tell a story, it's hard to argue with the fact that Peter Tallow has the right to tell her own story about this in any way she pleases. I'm sure there's some exceptions to that, but in this case, I think it's well within her authority. But one thing that an artist telling their own story does is it particularizes the story. This is what happened when I went through this. It's not quite the same as saying, here's what happened when people go through this, which is what it might come off as is an artist, if an artist detaches the representation of trauma from themselves. And that depends also on what art form you use. For a rapper like Kendrick Lamar, it's kind of not easy, but it's more appropriate to the genre for him to stand up there Take it to the opposite extreme. Uh, consider the controversy over an installation in Chicago that recreated the scene of teenager Michael Brown's death. Um, this uh, is one of the most disturbing images that I've seen in put up. It is not real. It is art. It is sculpture. And I'm going to show it extremely quickly. The intention behind the artwork was sympathetic to them, intending to show the horror as well as the banal acceptance of the death. Look, 
something like this. Now let's just do one of these. And yet, figures sympathetic to Brown, including his own father, criticized the book, just as attached to the white artist whose name was pseudonym, Hugh Rockmore, uh, was the one to create it. Cultural critic Kristen West Savali wrote that she was appalled at, quote, white artists' belief that they can claim artistic ownership of black death. Now, ownership is a word that's inserted there by Savali. I don't think Hugh Rockmore would have said, because I made this artwork, I own black death. And yet, she did feel that she could use it. I'm using kind of theoretical language, but I mean, think about what that, think about the context if I said those things in real life. I don't own it, but I can use it without asking whoever does. If you're figuring out that that's something you should do, it depends on who you're taking it from, how well you know them, what you're going to use it for, if you're going to return it in the same condition, that sort of thing. And so all these things go into this sort of cultural sphere where we're trying to figure out who has the right to tell these stories. Especially when you consider that a lot of the people who might have the right to tell this story are structurally kind of prevented from telling the story. I'm kind of sounding like a Dorno here. I'm going more towards the problems than the answers because the answers are harder to come by. So Savali, Brown's death, Savali is the critic, not the artist. Brown's death was repackaged and thrown to the consumption of the world which destroyed it. In no small part because in her eyes, the artist did not have enough at stake in the artwork to have the right to tell the story. Is it simply because of her race? Probably not. I think that's probably a big part of it. If Mike Brown had a white best friend attached to the hip their whole lives and this happened and that friend made artwork about this, we'd probably treat it a little bit differently. They'd probably still catch some heat, but it would be very different than an artist, the detached artist who has authority over all, coming in and saying, ah, this is what I want. That might be a little unfair to the world. She makes a lot of her art about these social issues, but it doesn't ease the pain that it caused Brown's father, for example, to again see the image reproduced, sent out into the world again. Even if the message is Brown was right and Darren Wilson was wrong and our society is completely effed up, even if that is the intention to repeat that image in the service of, set of, of, of uh, getting at that intention rather than giving a lecture, writing a newspaper article, something that might do less to put more images of what Cavalli calls black death into the mainstream, into the Chicago Tribune, which is where I got that article from. Sometimes, though, the expectation to, be, to deal with your own trauma and no one else's can be a cage, or worse, a source of even more trauma for an artist. When something bad has happened to you, the last thing you might want is to go through it again. And yet, if it's an intriguing part of your biography, it might be what draws people to you. Or, or, if you didn't even have anything bad happen to you, they might assume that you did because of your place in society. Consider Leonard Chang, who is a novelist. And he recently published some of the comments that a, what he calls, legendary editor sent him when he pitched his eighth novel to this publishing company when it was rejected. And there. The characters, especially the main character, just do not seem Asian enough. They act like everyone else. They don't eat Korean food, they don't speak Korean, and you have to think about ways to make these characters more ethnic, more different. And you can keep reading, it gets worse in such a way that I don't think I want to read it. So this implicates Chang's identity in a different way because he is marked as having, now, you know, whether he is in terms of suffering, I'm not quite saying that, but it does sort of show you a kind of popular fantasy about how minority artists should work in the world. That, oh good, you're here to represent the experience that you have. I mentioned this in my class the other day. If you ever watch the show Insecure on HBO, some of the characters complain that when they work in majority white workplaces, they're asked to be the interpreter of all black culture for the people of that workplace. And so this, I think, is a particularly extreme example of something like that. You are a Korean artist, which he's, I mean, he's also an American. That's why people don't act Korean, because they are American, but that's not good enough for the editor. Right? So you have some responsibility to represent the Asian spirit, or to represent whatever trauma is associated with being a minority. Um, yeah, I'll stop there for now. One more quick example that implicates an artist's identity in still a different way, I 
don't really know how to pronounce this person's name, so I'm going to say Leticia P. I apologize if that's incorrect. Um, and I don't know if this uh, has uh, a title. I put the hashtag Me Too because she made this hard work in response to the hashtag contained Me Too, which attempted to, on Facebook and Twitter, bring um, attention to just how common stories of sexual assault and harassment, especially for women, are in society. Uh, he is a hair artist, and she sculpts her own hair, and she made this. That's her Me Too contribution. Now, it is an image of trauma. It has the potential to do victims injustice by throwing them into other places. And it's something about the fact that you have to literally transform your own body in order to get this message across. Not only does this scene appear to be going from her, from the visitor, but the cartoon that she's with the character disappears and looks to be established. to a political issue or in response to an issue of harassment or in response to an issue of assault is an actual thing that people have to do. And so this artwork represents that quite literally. I find that there's a lot of um, interesting representations going off script uh, in, in a trauma, not a trauma, but a in, in art today. I'm thinking of the movie The Babadook, which is this horror movie um, about this uh, ghost kind of thing that basically haunts this family that lost the family member. And the metaphor for, you know, having this thing that's always there and you can never get rid of it, but you can learn to manage it or you can learn to deal with it is very strong. Um, Stranger Things is another thing I thought. Um, in the first season, uh, a character is kidnapped by some weird monster and taken to another dimension. I'm not going to spoil anything. I'm going to the first season. Um, and at the end of the first season, they get him back, basically. He's rescued and he's having that happy family, you know, uh, uh, end of story dinner, and he excuses himself from the table and he walks into the bathroom and sort of coughs off a little worm that represents the monster that, that, that is like a baby or something of the monster that captures him. And that's the end of the season, and we have to wait to see whether that worm is going to grow into anything. For the purpose of narrative, the worm is probably going to grow into something. But what, what caught me about that scene is the way, that's, that, the way that art is kind of, I think, adapting to the idea that this stuff doesn't leave you that you're always going to carry stuff with you in a certain form or, or in a certain representation of what was done to you. Another one of my questions when I talked about how I approach this stuff is how is the audience being treated? Cavill's idea that the audience is forced to watch stuff they're frustrated they can't stop must be partially based on the idea that they're not free to go at any time. Now, theaters aren't locked. You know, if you go see a play, you are technically free to go at any time, but it is These are, to get Foucault back in here a little bit, just little social things that control how we move. So yes, you're free to go, but in some sense, you're not without risking some kind of embarrassment or me counting you absent or something like that. Um, the, this opens up a new dimension with which to represent trauma or the affect that makes trauma so powerful. How are we making people sit through it? How are we delivering it to you? What choice are we giving to you about whether you experience this or not? Here's a trailer for a play called The Container by Claire Bailey, a play about human trafficking that takes place inside one of the shipping containers uh, that represents where a lot of people are trafficked. It was put on by Baltimore Center Stage a few years ago. This is uh, from a different production, I believe. Get out! Stay calm, okay? Six characters, one trucking container, and an audience of about two dozen. Man, this driver, he knows he has the power. What does he care if the French police lock you up, huh? All squeezed in together with no lights. This is Not the setting for this is the, the report, container. Sorry. 
a new London play that recreates the harrowing experience of illegal immigrants smuggled into Britain. No, 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 no. We already paid you. The play's director says he's aiming for maximum intensity. If we make them jump, if we startle them, then the person next to you is physically jumping next to you and it, you feel kind of the terror ripple through. I want to really get deep in somebody and really change how they view the world. So this is the actual container where the play takes place. And the whole idea is for the audience to come in and get the feeling of what it's like to be an illegal immigrant. So they literally sit side by side with the actors for the whole 65 minutes of the play. One critical difference between the play and real life, there are air holes drilled in here so the audience can breathe. So you can tell that the news reporter and especially the director are kind of criticizing the public position of the audience. He's putting the audience through, right? And this brings up this same conflict before. If you want someone to empathize with a victim, it does often do well to show them what that victim is going through. At the same time, do you want to make more people feel the way And are you more likely to do that than to cause any positive social change for your victims? These are the questions I just have to ask myself. Um, you know, it was, that's fine. Audiences can feel more than just trauma, though, when they're faced with this kind of stuff. They can feel warm, they can feel camaraderie, they can feel solidarity. Solidarity, especially, can be a welcome relief from trauma. The idea that you're with other people, that other people have your back. What the, what the music is likely to be about. Country music has a different likely subject matter than classical music. There are not very many string quartets about trucks. Now, there's no rules against string quartets about trucks, but that is a condition of the genre. It is constructed so. Uh, I, um, I grew up with folk music. My dad is a folk singer. Um, and folk singers, if you don't know, are old hippies. Born out of a tradition of Woody Guthrie, riding the rails and singing about politically left-wing groups. It's tough to be a conservative folk musician because of the subject matter. It's often very, you want to call it, socialist or populist. Um, the conservative folk musician uh, is a joke that's a very public bluegrass music. And I'm half kidding. I mean, bluegrass does sound like a folk. The music that goes into it is different. But what makes it even more different is the kind of perceived difference in motivation among the participants. If you be using music in order to do different things, no matter what the most important thing is. What well, we just kind of overlap is protest. Who loves protest? And what makes a protest powerful? And one way to think about this is what makes a good protest versus a bad protest. You ever been to a bad protest? I've been to a bad protest. Nothing like marching behind someone who doesn't know anything about Baltimore. You're going through the empty streets in Federal Hill, chanting things like that. Um, but there are good ones too, and the good ones objectify solidarity. You're going up to your opposition, and you're saying, you might have this idea that somewhere else there are people who oppose you, and we're going to put that in front of your face. We're going to make it an object. We're going to make it real, not abstract. That's why I always think, I, I had to told Greenmark if I want to write about the proper way to write chants. So that, like the one that goes, um, no Trump, no KKK, no fascist USA. And then I went to the women's march and it went, no Trump, no KKK, no fascist USA. Nobody talks like that. And it's hard to do. I mean, this is the music stuff. Anyway, it changes the, the ability with which you can stay together, with the ability with which you can objectify that unison. Which is the thing that you're trying to put right? Um, Rick Burkhart, who's the guy that wrote the play Conversation Storm about the use of torture earlier, is also a folk musician. Um, he's in a duo for a Prince of Michigan. Um, to Burkhart's perspective, uh, he wrote a song about Ronald Reagan. This was after Reagan's death. And after any prominent uh, political figure died, let's just say, the eulogies are often quite positive. More positive maybe than the reception was in life among the general public. Burkhardt, the of folk music, was sort of having none of it, and was kind of sick of the whitewashing of Reagan. Now, he wants to bring attention to some of what he considers the horrors that Reagan committed. He could write a play where we have 
the Met Summit. So we put those images back into the public. Of course, that creates some of the issues we talked about earlier. Rather than represent the details of those things, Burkhart wrote a postcard that objectifies solidarity and encourages a particular response in the audience.
comfortable singing along with that song. If you don't like to sing, you probably felt a little uncomfortable singing that song. If you're sitting near something you're trying to impress, maybe you felt a little uncomfortable singing that song. The idea is that no matter how inclusive any genre or any artwork tries to be, it will never ultimately be totally inclusive. This is one big lie that a lot of artists and a lot of promoters tell you. This art is for everybody. That is literally never true, I promise you and I guarantee you. There is no artwork, there is no art genre, there is no social situation that does not exclude some people, make people feel uncomfortable. And so the goal cannot be, I'm not gonna make anyone feel uncomfortable, the goal has to be who? Who am I choosing to include? You have to make that a positive decision. Where are we at here? Kind of don't feel like, I got one more thing to talk about. Oh, the other thing is that all that stuff, I didn't know what all that stuff was the first time I heard the song. If you're listening and I'm thinking, and like all this, and, and the Marcus is who are the Marcus and, and all this, and you start looking it up, and, and what, what I was done, I mean, that's the Stanley Cavill thing. I was motivated. I wouldn't be here the hell out of the 1980s after the first time I heard that song because I needed to know more about what it was. So rather than reproduce dramatic images, he did something that would make me go and figure it out for myself. Kind of. And it wouldn't make everyone do that, but that's the way of art. One last thing that I want to talk about here. This is something that you can go see right now um, at not an art gallery, but at the University of Maryland, Baltimore Health Sciences Library, which is on Lombard and Green Street. You can get in with your UBID. And there's an art exhibit up right now that is artwork and masks made by veterans who are suffering from PTSD. And this is often what we call art being implicated in that phrase. So let's just watch a little bit of this uh, video. But what seems to have the most impact is this mask is one of the making. therapists. Finally, these invisible wounds don't just have a name. They have a face. And when service members create these masks, it allows them to come to grips, literally, with their trauma. And it's amazing how often that enables them to break through the trauma and start to heal. Remember BFib? 
That was a real experience for one of my patients. And when he created his mask, he was able to let go of that haunting image. Initially, it was a daunting process for the service member, but eventually he began to think of BFib as the mask, not his internal wound. And he would go to leave each session, he'd hand me the mask and say, Melissa, take care of him. Eventually, we placed BFib in a box to further contain him. And when the service member went to leave the NICO, he chose to leave BFib behind. A year later, he had only seen BFib twice, and both times BFib was smiling and the service member didn't feel anxious. Now, whenever that service member is haunted by some traumatic memory, he continues to paint. Every time he paints these disturbing images, he sees them less or not at all. So, I mean, that's pretty powerful stuff. One thing I want to point out is that, as usual, the is also going to be about money. And you're going to start an experience. This person has put part of their trauma in a place where they can separate it from situations where they don't want to include it. But the catharsis is not for disembodied audience members who need to learn more about them. It's as though you can make art that will literally help the person who is suffering. And that's one reason, I mean, art therapy theory for the day. Does it matter whether or not the victims are the artists? Does this mean that artists should stay out of trauma entirely? Or deal in trauma only if it's their own? Or find new, exciting ways of working through it that aren't necessarily repeating the images, throwing the victims to the consumption of the world which destroyed them? What is the ethical responsibility of artists who represent trauma and an audience who is that consumer? That's the kind of thing I want us to be thinking about, and I welcome your thoughts on it, and thank you very much for having me. So I'm happy to field any questions or experiences or things like that, Richard? question I have about that artwork is why do it? I mean, in the sense that we already have the most powerful image you could possibly have. You know, if you want to use an image to put more information about that time out there, you've got the photograph. Why aestheticize it? Why stylize it? I mean, it's almost like you're lessening the pain of it. So it's easier to do by putting it in the Is it cultural appropriation? I would not be arrested for doing it, but I would probably be ostracized by some people. I would face social consequences. 
that to me, the whole cultural appropriation thing, can you take things that are not from your own culture and use them? It's a case-by-case -case basis. I used turmeric in my cooking last night. I think that's okay. I mean, I think it's okay. Maybe it's not okay. It's very, very different than Miley Cyrus walking out and twerking when the people she's paid that are paid, you know, a tenth of what she's paid uh, are part of the culture that actually developed that thing. Right? Who, who are you taking from? To what degree are you taking it? What are you using it for? I think these are all questions that go into the cultural appropriation discussion.
story, you know, we accumulate stories, and they tell us how the world works. And so that story accumulates to well, cause and effect. And it's important, I think, to tell the story and say, no, no cause and effect. No. <laughs> no. I, I don't know why, but that's what makes me uncomfortable to say that. I think the mother is being the mother. You know? Because if it's not clear, what I think the art, the definition of art is, has to do with social, with, with what you're doing social. You're in a place where you feel like you're going to receive some kind of image that is transferred to an artistic situation. And, you know, if you go into a funeral, and you're going to take any funeral to take artistic photographs, then yeah, that's an artistic situation for you, but you're probably going to piss off two people while you're doing it, right? Because the two social situations are, are clashing. Are there
talking about artists being marked, um, you know, I my my music my music degree is in music composition. I have a PhD in the composition of music. Does that mean I can write you any kind of music right now? No, it means I can write you one very small specific kind of music. Is there a PhD in hip hop music? There's a there's a sort of a, a pinky African pinky song for those who are on and um, it was sampled by Ruby Hancock, who is a friendly jazz artist, for the song Watermelon Man. I want to say, um, and it starts off like that. And of course, did he you know send a royalty check to the pinky like you would have to if you took a song to Bob Fred again? No, he didn't. Then. Madonna came along and made a song and sampled that portion of the Herbie Hancock song. And she did have to write a check to Herbie Hancock for that song. And so, and, and Hancock tried to leverage his identity when an interviewer asked him about that, why he didn't have to pay, but Madonna had to pay him. His answer was, um, and this is kind of uncomfortable, but his answer was, it's a brother. Right? The idea that my race gives me access because these other people share in some sense the same race. That doesn't convince me. I don't know, maybe it convinces some people because the social aspects are complex. We're not only defined by our race, we're also defined by our, where we're born and our class and what we have access to. In the same token, you know, I don't know. Is this better than nothing? 
that might be the question that I can say. All right, thank you guys so much. <laughs>